Good morning, and um, thank you for the invitation. I think I was invited, wasn't I? I didn't sign up myself. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for this invitation then. Um, I have 15 minutes um, to introduce you to what we're doing at uh, one of the major German archaeology research institutions of the somewhat clumsy name, Römisch Germanisches Zentralmuseum. We're thinking about changing it to make it more adaptable to an international community, but um, uh, well, let's just go. Uh, what um, you all know, or most of you know, that uh, the Neolithic expansion has been debated, the, the, the reasons behind the Neolithic expansion has been debated for probably over 100, maybe more, 120 years, I found, late uh, 19, uh, 1980, uh, uh, 1880s. Uh, citations where people already debated why those farmers uh, came in eventually and that has been a topic uh, in research for yeah for a century now so also this paper will be concerned with a minute detail of this expansion why and how it happened and we will be focusing on the region where we are, well, I always focus on, on Western Central Europe, highlighted here within that box. We will look at three time periods, which also would, which are determined by the archaeology itself, the early Neolithic of the famous, infamous linear pottery culture, the middle Neolithic, that's the succeeding cultures in the tradition of the early Neolithic linear pottery culture, uh, and then the, what, um, some people call young Neolithic, in German, young Neolithic, um, it's a clumsy name again, but the young Neolithic um, um, characterized mainly by the Mischelsberg culture. There is um, a major difference between the early Neolithic, while the early Neolithic populations, we know that from, from the genetist work, came from Hungary and moved westwards, basically. They also moved Ephraim, but westwards. For our case, Michelsberg is now believed to have emerged somewhere in the Paris Basin, um, between the Paris Basin and the Ardennes uh, or the Eiffel Mountain Range, and from there expanded eastward. So there's two um, uh, counter movements of populations within that time period, and there's this, basically these three uh, major archaeological entities uh, that are um, of major concern here in our presentation. Um, <clears throat> We have been using the adaptive cycles, again famous and infamous at the same time. Uh, they were introduced in archaeology in the early 2000s. They have made it to Germany about 10 years later. That's the usual delay. Something is invented in, the, in, in, in North America and then it, it gets picked up in Germany about 10 to 15 years later. It happened the same way with the adaptive cycles. And since about 2008, 2010, we've been thinking about how we could use the concept of adaptive, adaptive cycles, cycles and the interlinked uh, concept, concept of resilience in explaining the dynamics of the uh, Neolithic expansion <clears throat> and these three periods that we see in the early to young Neolithic. Um, resilience is a major operating force, so to speak, uh, in, um, in, um, in the adaptive cycle concept, but both adaptive cycles and resilience, and probably by now most of you know, have the problem that they're just intuitive metaphors. You know, we can think about those things, but it is very difficult to find those metaphors in the archaeological records, which, which eventually you need to do to apply them directly and robustly. So the major question that we've asked ourselves uh, over the years is, right down there, how to define, classify, and measure, measure resilience as a major force. Um, and as a social phenomenon in the archaeological record because the adaptive cycles, if you look at the literatures on adaptive cycles, there's a number of factors that have been used in you know, looking for those cycles. Uh, those factors might come out of the field of economics, out of the field of population dynamics. Stephen Shannon's group's work is famous for that, although he doesn't use adaptive cycles or hasn't used adaptive cycles so far. Uh, then we have questions of land use, also very much used uh, in that field. And um, we have added the component of what we call social diversity. Um, we think that one of the major resilience factors in those cyclical 
uh, in those cyclical fluctuations throughout history might have been a component that we called social diversity or if archaeological re resolution permits social identity we all know that social matters so particularly identity matters that have been debated we all remember in the 1980s early 1990s and then we abandoned talking about identity mostly mostly ethnologists and cultural anthropologists we abandoned talking about identity uh, to a greater extent because it's so very difficult to find in the archaeological record. The, 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 the thing is that identity is something that fluctuates within yourself. You know, you have various levels of identity and it fluctuates through time. Identities change rather quickly and that makes it very difficult to find identities, long-run identities in the archaeological record. But apart from um, things like body decoration, which reflects personal identity to some extent, uh, and which is, as we know, rarely preserved in the archaeological record, we do have occasionally good evidence, for instance, from pottery decoration. Pottery decoration might reflect certain levels of identity on a personal level and on a more group-oriented level at least in some periods for some times. Not always, obviously, not always, but some periods and sometimes. So we choose, as we lack the body decoration, well, we do have some in the early Neolithic, uh, we look at pottery um, time series in order to see whether we can use them for understanding fluctuations in social diversity or social identity. We use, apply the theory promoted by Touchville and Turner, social psychologists uh, that have established a, a complex theory about ident how identity works on, your, on, the, on the personal level and moves from that personal level into the group level. Uh, it, I could lecture about this for hours, I can't obviously, so I go on to the next slide. Um, the problem is to adapt this theory to the archaeological record, and we came up, it's just being published, I understand, I have the final proofs on my uh, little cell phone. Uh, we have established, a, a sort of, we're trying to establish a methodology of how to find these concepts of social diversity, or if, per, if archaeological resolution permits social identity in the archaeological record, and we found that we can work better for most periods with the concept of social diversity. However, you need to keep in mind that this is an aggregate parameter. It is composed of various levels. So it is, it is something that we might not be able to really find on the ground, but that's something more on an abstract... Uh, I don't know, that's my wife. <laughs> and, sorry, I need to... <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's an aggregate parameter that is somewhat... Uh, many people have, pro German colleagues have problems with it to, to, um, to reach that level of, of abstract... Um, yeah, of, of abstraction from the archaeological record. It is nothing that you can really find on the ground, but something that we need to look at from a, from a more uh, loftier level, I should say. Um, but um, the archaeological data just becomes denser at this level. So let's look at the case studies. We have the earliest linear pottery culture, uh, which has been um, researched for again 120 years. These are simple farming, lineage based uh, societies with dispersed settlements and they don't have any marked hierarchies. At least we haven't found any so far. They cover most of Central Europe and we look at the most western part of it. There we look at the state of Baden Württemberg, boxed right there at the border to the French. Uh, to, the, to, to the French um, uh, phenomenon of the early Neolithic. And we looked at the pottery explicitly and we were able, particularly my colleague uh, Christoph Strin was able to, um, uh, to come up with, with a robust, really we think robust database saying that parts of the motives in the pottery actually reflect sort of lineage association of those that have made the pots. We think that women mostly have made the pots, so it is basically women lineage identity that is 
uh, reflected in these motives. And then we have the uh, larger band motives, which characterize the linear pottery culture. And this reflects something that we cannot understand immediately on the ground, but we think that this reflects somewhat social diversity. And you can see from those curves, the upper, it's blurred from here. Is it also blurred from far away? It's good? All right. Um, you, can, you can see the curve number B. Uh, that's the that's the individual motives. They are lineage emphasis, thus is high in Baden-Württemberg at the beginning of the uh, of the LPK, uh, and then it drops down all of a sudden, without no apparent reason. We don't understand why it drops there. Whereas what we call this social diversity um, is low at the beginning, then it rises and then it drops again, uh, and this drop is sort of enforced by a major drop at the end of the fifth millennium. These are those gray, uh, those, those, those gray shades, and down there are the, uh, are, the, are the the climate proxies. So we see that the social, the social mechanisms within these simple farming societies apparently work on their own. They're not, there's nothing external that would explain this drop right there in the middle, nor the rise. There's not, no, there's no, well, we have climate fluctuations, but they can't be really linked with our high chronological scheme. So all we see is that this major draw, and it was a major draw, uh, that this major draw had enforced really these social uh, processes. And at the same time that we see sort of a return to societies becoming more rigid. That's the explanation. We took that from our research, that societies become more rigid. At the same time, we see the population curve rise. So apparently, the increase in societal rigidity was favorable for the population curve, which then, again, means that those general templates that we always use for adaptive cycle or any cycle theory um, can be you know, taken down into individual cycles which have individual tipping points which are time lag. And we came up with this model which was published in 2017. We were forced by the reviewers to publish it. I was a bit hesitant, but we've stuck with it right there. So we see that there's a social diversity dynamic which would probably precede population dynamics in simple farming societies. We will research that in other examples in the near future. And we've taken from Peter Turchin the basic template of integrative and disintegrative cycles. Well, this is actually published with, with Peter together. So we've used some of his terminology and adapted it to our terminology with the adaptive cycle and came up with this combined, um, combined template. But what, what our point is that um, social dynamics are time lagged to population dynamics, which means population dynamics doesn't tell you everything. Usually population dynamics are, tell you, that's the major thing, you know, population, population, uh, important, obviously, but uh, those social, those extremely difficult to grasp social dynamics might be the actual triggering force. That's our idea. Next example, somewhat 500 to 1,000 years later, Middle Neolithic, again, simple farpers, Sing, single far, simple farmers, clear site hierarchies, status markers, elites, at least in some areas, and marked social hierarchies. I know there are some objections to this, but in general, let's just take it as in general. We've looked at this, we've adapted the same methodology. Uh, you see the early Neolithic cycles right there. Unfortunately, the middle Neolithic data set does not allow us without an enormous amount of, of time investment, which we haven't been able to, uh, to come to population <coughs> population calculation. So we've just uh, taken the um, the uh, diversity motive, diversity curve again, and this is the curve that we came up with. Um, and again, you see the stylistic diversity rises with the beginning of the Neolithic, then comes to a tipping point, and then uh, goes to the then drops again. So we suggest the same social mechanisms are at operation. We have rigid societies at the beginning. Then those societies become more diverse in their social thinking, as, as I said, as an aggregate component. And then those societies towards the end 
become rigid again. We were all surprised that this corresponds well to the precipitation curve in the area, but we don't have any explanation for it right now. We need to adjust the chronology a bit to see what, what is actually behind it. So, all right. There again, we see that these, in fact, no, I'm, I'm almost through. Uh, that we see that the, thank you, that we see that the, um, the, the, the social diversity curve um, is um, a force operating in itself, and here it is again somewhat linked to the precipitation curve, something we cannot really ascribe right now. It may just be that, you know, drought periods were unfavorable for these simple farming societies, and the more it rained, until it rained too much, um, those societies uh, were able to grow in a way, and then it became drier again, and the societies turned to rigidity. Well, we'll have to see. All right, Michel's back. The next, um, the next level, as I said, uh, emerged in the Paris Basin to Ardennes and then moved westward uh, or eastward. Uh, these were agro-pastoralists. Uh, they have clear ciphers, hierarchies, status markers, elites, at least for the early periods, and marked social hierarchies, particularly evident from the genetic work right now. This is the simple curve that we came up for this period because, unfortunately, Michelsberg, as all young Neolithic pottery in central Germany, is very simple. There is almost no decoration. It's just form variation, and we cannot come up with a high motive resolution as we have for the previous 2,000 years. So we're stuck really simply with uh, a coarse pottery, um, a coarse pottery chron chronology. Uh, but it also follows basically the same template that we've seen before. We have an early simple pottery tradition, then it becomes more diverse as for with forms, and gen then it drops again to very simple, uh, just a few styles at the very end. And this is uh, then combined with the site number council sort of population proxy. It's, it, it's not the same, unfortunately, it cannot, the, the, the same methodology as we applied for the previous 2,000 years cannot be applied here anymore, but we see the same general dynamics happen, and they also can be linked to the same climate proxy, and through, uh, it gets all the way drier, and the final point is, uh, just like with the, uh, with the LBK, is linked to a brief uh, drought period. So we come up with this three-cycle model, and we propose that social dynamics out of the data, hard data that we have from the LBK, that social dynamics really are the, for, is the forcing agent for the entire three cycle early to young Neolithic um, data that we have in Central Europe. Thank you very much. I must, well, I'm, not, I'm not through yet. The second part of our talk, how much really can be calculated to social components in general, is being presented by my colleague Kai Wiltz in session 140. And I don't want to instruct you, obviously. I just thought I'll let you know. In room CCCB 11A, there Kai comes up. He uses a different data set, but the same cycles, and came up with a with an idea of how to calculate the percentage of the social component in those cyclical movements. So now they have got a second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.